All right. So I've got some notes here. Um, there's a little bit of preparation that we have. We have a uh, PowerPoint, but I'm not going to entirely stick to that because a fair bit of what I'm going to be talking about is going to be a story from memory. Um, so are we starting? We're going to go. Maybe in? just give a 60, 60 more seconds for a, a couple of people. We'll give two minute grace period at least because then we, we didn't <laughs> get right. a full three minute break. Um, yeah, we can entertain people with a, maybe a, just a couple. Yeah. But when did you start playing the harp? Um, around 1991. Um, I was living in an intentional neo-pagan community in East Tennessee, and somebody dropped off a harp that they had built that they didn't know how to play. And so I took it up to my cabin and uh, obsessed on it for a few weeks and was playing this is the one you see in the background is one that i had made back in the aughts <laughs> for me by um steve green of uh west virginia it's a steen harp that's beautiful here we go our desert wolf is returned from las vegas <laughs> wonderful we can't start without las vegas in the house oh yeah well we need our Viva. All right. Okay. I'll quit messing with things. Yeah, it's all right. Okay, I'm just going to... Let's kick it off. Okay. We ready to go? I believe so. Okay. So. Well, hello to everyone who is attending... Uh, I'm known in the um, magical community as Olerian and have been since 1982. I'm also known as Alan Moore for those who are a little more mundanely oriented. Um, and Terry and I have been working on Enochian for quite a while. This presentation is going to be about where did John D. and Edward Kelly's Enochian material come from? And where we um, get our inspiration and information from. So I'm going to start by sharing the screen. Over a moment. Okay, this is just an introduction. Where did John D. and Edward Kelly's Enochian material actually come from? What you see are images you've already seen. John D. And Edward Kelly, D on the right, Edward Kelly on the left. And um, the tablets down below are the four elemental tablets in the Tablet of Union as we use them. These are the ones that I put together. Um, and on the top left, we've got the pentagram and the at traditional, what nowadays is considered the traditional attributions of the elements to the points of the pentagram. But we have discovered that where that came from was the Enochian material, that it doesn't really exist in this form before uh, D and Kelly received the Enochian. And specifically, the Raphael recension of the Great Table of Earth gives us this pattern of spirit at the top, air, water, earth, and fire in the four lower regions. So, where did the and Kelly's Enochian material come from? I should give you a little bit of background for those who don't know me. Uh, so, let's see. I've worked with Enochian magic, this lifetime anyway, for over 40 years. Uh, Terry Burns, my magical partner and wife, and I have written several articles for the Journal of the Western Mystery Tradition or for certain private groups. We worked and studied with our good friend, Vincent Bridges, um, who died in 2014. Um, before that, he mentored us on his version of the Enochian system and many other things. 
We led several Enochian workshops and conferences in the Czech Republic and Italy prior to his death. And just for informational purposes, I have served as Hierophant in several initiatory orders. And just recently have been co-moderating two Facebook groups dedicated to teaching Enochian magic our particular version of it, our particular system. And um, you will eventually discover why we say our system, because we have a very specific approach to Enochian, the wise and everything. Um, so the source of the material that we're gonna talk about is also tied up in why we believe that our approach to Enochian is a correct one and one that we should be using. So I've had a lifelong interest in alphabets since I was young. Back in the 70s, I created something I call Starscript, within it, which if anybody's interested, I can show it another time. And it, no, it wasn't the same as Enochian, but this is the Enochian version that we use in our tables and our script. Actually, I want to give credit to Darlene Artist. Uh, she was formerly uh, a partner of Vincent Bridges while he was in the United States. And she's an expert on fonts and fontography. And she did a beautifully cleaned up version of Enochian, uh, which uh, is called Darlene Enochian TTF for anyone who's interested. And I would like to give her credit for it because it's my absolute favorite version of the Enochian alphabet. It's, it's the most beautiful and the cleanest. And as we say here, later on, I became interested in the ideas of these letters and other letters as energetic waveguides. And that's something that Darlene talks about in her article where she introduces this. And also, I am convinced that one of the things that has helped me move energy and connect wing with higher intelligences was a combination of something that I was born with and something that was augmented by higher intelligences and focused by, not created by, and focused by the study of ceremonial magic, especially as it relates to sacred geometry and sacred alphabets. And interestingly, it was these mediumistic contacts, which I will talk about later, which were at first, if not totally unwilling, they were certainly unanticipated and I didn't initiate them. Um, they led me to the study of ceremonial magic and they led me to the means to connect with and work with the initiatory orders I did. I would ask them, is this something I should have anything to do with? And they would tell me. I don't believe these contacts were angels in the sense that most Judeo-Christian believers believe they are. However, I do believe that they relate to the Greek idea of angels or Angliophoros, um, which is the idea of a messenger. They definitely were messengers. And I have a reason for believing that they were the same type or species of people that were talking to Dean Kelly 400 years ago. Uh, well, at least they say they are. Okay, I'm going to ending, end my screen share. Um, so click up there where it says stop share. Right there. Okay, hello. Okay, I have a story to tell, actually. This story does not involve dream experiences. It doesn't involve trance. It doesn't involve psychoactive substances. Although later on they may come into play, but it's basically actual physical experiences that I had that have led me to a lot of this stuff. 
So I'll start the story now. In 19, let's see, 1974, in the winter of 73 to 74, probably late December or early January, I was with a group of friends who were metaphysically minded. We were part of one of the many metaphysically oriented groups in Atlanta at the time. And uh, we had finished a session uh, on a Saturday night and had um, had a very late dinner or early breakfast at Denny's on a, near I-85 in Atlanta. When I started picking up something, I started getting a energy feeling across the top of my head, sort of like static electricity. And I started hearing a humming or whining noise in my ear. And I asked one of the other friends that was with us who had a reputation for being fairly clairvoyant. Do you sense anything? Do you feel anything? And she said, absolutely. Somebody is out there. Something is out there. So somebody ran, paid our bill. I ran out front of the um, restaurant and looked up in the sky. And all I saw were the lights of aircraft, which I was pretty familiar with. Um, the red lights of a helicopter and a couple of planes and an air airliner way up high. But I didn't see anything unusual. So I ran around behind the building into the alleyway behind the building where the dumpster was. There was a big retaining wall and a line of trees. So she, you couldn't see anything beyond where I was. And I stood there for a moment and looked around. And before I could decide to leave, something happened. A very large shadow that I could not see the distinct shape edges of it was seemed to be somewhat oval or cigar shape started passing silently over my head just above the top of the pine trees and it was silent but not only was it silent everything else was all of a sudden i couldn't hear the traffic noise and i was right next to an expressway i couldn't hear uh there was a nightingale or some kind of late night bird that was singing and things Suddenly it was silent, nothing. I could hear nothing. And this shape, this dark mass got directly overhead of me. And then, and there were two red lights, one after the other along the length of it. And as I looked up at it, I was absolutely startled so much I fell to my knees because two of the brightest blue-white lights, like spotlights, came on on either side of the red lights and illuminated the whole area there. And if anybody ever saw the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, well, uh, this was many years before that, well, many years. This was about four years before that movie came out. But it was like Roy Neary's experience in his pickup truck. Suddenly there was such a bright light that it looked like there was a mist in the air. And I'm not kidding, it was. It, it was just amazing. And I started feeling a sense of like an electric current running through me. I raised my hands up from my position on my knees and I started getting a series of images, lightning fast. It was like a data dump is how I interpreted it later. Just this series of very fast series of images I could not even parse. And it seemed like it was going into my mind somewhere. After that went on for a little while, it stopped. The shape, which I now assume to have been a craft of some kind, continued on uh, in a direction, let's see, it was going for this way, this way, it was, it was going towards the east. And the two blue-white lights shut off as it got past me. And it continued on silently and went past the trees till I couldn't see it anymore. By this point, I was very close to hysterical. Uh, I should mention I was 20 years old at the time. So I jumped up, started to run, slipped, fell again. I had blood running down my knees and then ran back around to the front of the building where my three friends were. And I was pretty inarticulate. I was just sputtering and spewing. And ah, did you did eventually got out? Did you see that? No, they hadn't seen anything. They'd all been riveted looking the opposite direction. They didn't see a thing. And I must 
you know, I want to reiterate, I was doing no psychoactive substances whatsoever. I hadn't even had a drink, nothing. So I told them when they got me to calm down enough to tell them, I told them what had happened. And, and, and I said, I, could somebody drive us? I've got to see this again. I've got to find them. So we hopped in the car. We started driving all around. We were near Buckhead in Atlanta. So we started driving around the Buckhead area and finally ended up at about a 10 story apartment high rise that was mostly elderly people, but a friend of ours was living there. So we went in, went up to his room. It was three in the morning by then, knocked on his door. He came out to the door, putting his glasses on and squinty eyed and half asleep and said, can you get us to the roof? And, you know, he said, yeah, he could. So we all went to the service elevator, went up to the roof, started looking around. And I noticed right about in the position of Sirius or very close to where Sirius normally is, a light that was flashing different colors. It was like going blue, white, red, blue, white, red in a pattern. And I said to the other four, by this time, four people, let's try an experiment. Let's try thinking at this thing. Now, it sounds kind of new agey and all that, but we were used to meditating. We were used to experimenting with stuff like that. So I said, here's what we do. Look at that, focus on that object and think this. If there is someone there who can hear us, show us. So we all started meditating, staring at the object. And it seemed like a long time, but it was probably no more than a few minutes. I saw, I had an excellent vision at the time. I had better than 2020 vision. And I saw outside, it looked like an orb, not a point of light, like a star. And I saw a tiny little light come out to the side of it and rotate around it. One way, rotate it around it the other way. And then suddenly, I can't do it as fast as it happened, but just almost instantly, it, it described a spiral. And when it got to the end of the spiral, it was a cigar-shaped object with two red lights on it. And it zipped through a cloud bank that we, that we could see just to the east and lit it up red as it passed through. Now, two of the four of us, five of us saw that. And it was just kind of like we were, whoa, <laughs> what you saw was real. Well, I didn't exactly know what to do with that, but we went home. I actually made an entry in my journal about it. And then the next year, in 1975, I was living out uh, in a rural area, which is no longer rural now, but it was then, with a couple of friends who were also part of this group, so they were open to paranormal stuff. And around midnight, I was sitting in their kitchen, and I said, I suddenly had something hit me. I could barely move. It felt like an energetic charge was running through my body. And, and a voice came into my head and said, get something to write with. So I asked them, do you have a notepad? Do you have a pen or a pencil? They did. They brought it to me. And a series of tones sounding like a synthesizer would sound now, very pure sine wave tone, started very deep, very low, and then cascaded up through the frequencies until it got too high for me to hear. And as soon as it did, I was in some kind of light trance. And I heard a voice say, write down everything we say. And I proceeded to write down or have dictated to me 10 pages of information. It was information about the extraterrestrial beings I was talking to, about their spacecraft, about their propulsion, about where they were from, and what they were doing here, and why they were talking to me. 
it was 10 pages. I will talk more about what was in those 10 pages in a little bit, but it was very, very interesting. It seemed to me, well, as they described themselves to me, they said, we are part of an alliance of species. We're part of uh, what you might call a federation that are here with the purpose of helping guide humanity through a very difficult transition. And they said, we are specifically engineers who focus on first contact. The people with whom you will be communicating are a different species from us. And when you are ready, we will connect you with them. Um, they described, like I say, they described the propulsion systems, how the craft worked, how they were communicating with me. They said it was uh, a, either a technology-assisted consciousness or a consciousness-assisted technology, that they used a natural telepathic ability that they had, and it was augmented by uh, technological means, and um, it was attuned to certain frequencies that I manifested. So they said that had something to do with how they were communicating with me. So they told me that eventually I was going to be contacted with my regular hmm, contactees. So now we'll fast forward. Let me get a sip of water. So if you're with me, I will fast forward to 1982. And I was riding in a car with a couple of different friends who were part of, at the time, a Wiccan organization. I was very interested in things like that. And so we had a couple of friends with us, once again, who were accustomed to paranormal um, experiences and ideas. And, um, and I said, I don't know why. I remember getting hit by that energy again, like when I had had the communication in 1975, I was hit by this energy. So I said, can we park somewhere nearby? Like a park, we ended up in a church parking lot. And by the time we got there, I had so much energy running through me. I was arched on my ankles and my neck back this energy just ramming through me. Finally, enough energy had gone through me that I, my consciousness kind of set to the side, like I was in a trance. So I was from that point listening. And my voice started speaking. And it was people who said that they were the ones I was told that I would be in touch with, that I would be contacted by. And um, all they told me about who they were was that they were part of this alliance of species, that they had, they were taking up where the first contactors or the engineers who, by the way, looked sort of like greys in my mind, so I'm assuming that's who they were. Um, well, these new guys, I asked them, well, can you give me a picture of what you look like in my head? And so they gave me an image. And the impression I got, although I couldn't be sure about size exactly, they were somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to eight feet tall. Blue, very blue skin white what looked like hair but I wasn't sure it was and they had instead of the black eyes of the grays they had normal eyes but they were larger than ours and a very triangular face and the impression I had is they had more than five fingers probably six but I'm not sure now none of that really matters in the long run but I was curious who are you and where are you from and they said that where we are from doesn't matter because it no longer exists that we now live where we travel because um, the origin of our civilization is gone. We're a very old species. They said the earth was way too dense and way too toxic for them. So they did not do first contact and they were rarely ever seen if at all by humans in physical form. They said, we are not spiritual beings. 
we're not spirits. We are physically incarnated beings, but we are of a higher dimensional frequency than you exist at. And we can move interdimensionally. So, but they, so they, it, it, who, wherever exactly they were originally from, they were extraterrestrial, are extraterrestrial, and they are what we would call interdimensional. Now, at that time, I'd never heard of anything like this. Now, since we have Dr. Stephen Greer and all the stuff he's talked about, and it meshes perfectly with all of this, but this was way before he went public with that stuff. So um, they said, get a group of people together who can, who would be interested and would be open to this and open up for contact once a week. And so I assembled a group of people, people who were interested. It were four or five originally. They eventually ended up only being three. And we did. We got together. We went into meditation. We circulated energy like we were used to doing. And these people would come through. And eventually they told us to get a tape recorder. Back at the time, it was cassette recorders. And so they wanted us to record the sessions. And I even had a friend later transcribe some of them. Yeah, the wife would transcribe a bunch of them. Yeah, yeah. And um, so they told us more over a period of time. For a period of almost a year, we had weekly communications. Some of them were recorded. Some of them were not. And so we eventually ended up calling the people I was talking to because we didn't really know what species they were. They, they didn't give us a name. So I called them the three because one thing we did learn is that they almost, these particular people, this particular species, always functioned in groups of three. I suspect that their reproductive uh, group is three, not two. <laughs> and, and there were a lot of reasons that I ended up suspecting that from them. But uh, they would combine their own mental abilities to communicate and one of them would insinuate themselves into the space made when I went into kind of a, a trance and they would use my vocal apparatus and talk. And um, they told me it wasn't perfectly accurate that my own mind did influence, have some influence on what was coming through, but they said at the best, it was usually at least 80% accurate what they intended for me to be saying. And I was told lots of different things over a period of time. Uh, one, that the earth was passing, getting ready to pass through at that time, a band of energy that it passed through regularly on, on the solar system circuit around the center of the galaxy. And that every time it did, that things changed dramatically on the earth. The last time it did was somewhere around what we now call the Younger Dryas. And um, they said that it often resulted in the fall of civilizations and great destruction. Uh, but it was a pure energy of transformation. And they said what they wanted to do was establish an energy field or grib or web of light around the earth that would contain these energies and help promote positive transformation or evolution out of that energy. They said, without that, our civilization would end up collapsing again. And there would be great death and destruction. It wouldn't necessarily be the end of the world, but it would be the end of the world we live in. And they wanted to prevent that. They specifically said they did not want a nuclear war to occur and they had been monitoring our nuclear activities ever since the first atomic test because they said that nuclear and thermonuclear explosions i have no way of testing this but this is what they told me have an effect that passes through temporal boundaries and dimensional boundaries and space 
and that those civilizations in the galaxy that are somewhat separated from us both dimensionally and in space and time would be very negatively impacted that so they could be grievously harmed by the combined energy of multiple nuclear explosions on the earth they wanted to prevent it for that reason and they also wanted to see the human race survive and evolve into a form that could then join them in their intergalactic civilization or their interstellar civilization they so i i'm just condensing like a year's worth of information so they said that at the time that we passed through this which by the way they projected it ahead and it was closer to 2012 when they said the strongest effects of this would begin and they said by then we need this energetic structure complete around the earth to help guide the evolution of humanity and the planet they said not only would the human species evolve if this is successful but most of the others would too in their own way and the planet which they told us the planet is a living being and it also will evolve if this is successful so let's fast forward a little bit. In 1986, I received an invitation to move to this intentional uh, earth religion-based community in uh, East Tennessee called Serenarid. I received an invitation. So in communication with the three, I asked them, is this the right thing for me to do? And they said, yes, we've instigated it, go. Um, so I did, I moved there and the year after I moved there, there was a big dynamic breakup. The couple that owned the community went through a divorce and, um, the gentleman who I'd become friends with, uh, who goes by the name Shore, George Chapel, decided to move to Albuquerque where another member of his specific tradition lived. And I asked the three again. I hadn't been talking to them regularly by this time, but I went into trance and tried to contact them, did. And I said, absolutely, you're supposed to go. There's something you will find there that you need. So I went with him. Now, another year passed, and I discovered that my friend, had encountered and been inducted into some kind of magical society. I didn't know what. And up to that point, I'd never been personally interested in ceremony and magic. I was interested in the paranormal. I had learned how to run energies to sense uh, subtle energies and work with them. But what I was told then, I asked them, I said, you know, am I supposed to be to have anything to do with this organization he's a part of. And they said, when you were invited, accept. And I, and, and I was going, what is the reason for this? And they said, it is not an end in itself, but they said, you will learn techniques and gain tools that will help you do what you need to do in the future. And so I was, I did allow myself to be inducted. I was initiated. And it turned out to be one of the modern versions of the Golden Dawn, which oddly enough, at that time, I never heard of. I was very focused in what I studied. And so I hadn't heard of the Golden Dawn. So I, was, I joined, I went through the initiatory system. And by the time I moved back to the community in East Tennessee, which was in the early 90s, uh, I was an adept in the system. Uh, we went through lots of different uh, experiences, issues, problems, dynamic tensions. Uh, we ended up leaving that group, forming our own group, and doing a heck of a lot of work. 
But in the meantime, during this period of time, and yes, indeed, I did learn techniques and gained tools because I discovered Enochian. I'd never heard of it before that. Now, the Golden Dawn, or it's specifically the Stella Matutina version of the Golden Dawn, which is what we had been following from Israel Regardi's book, leaves out a lot. It has certain aspects of it. They recognized that the Enochian had power, but they didn't understand it. And they didn't use most of the system. They just mostly used the elemental tablets to juice up their initiations. And I thought, that can't be all of it. That can't be all of it at all. So uh, on my own, I started investigating the Enochian and started working with it. I did gain some magical tools by, uh, that have helped me tremendously, specifically the greater invoking ritual of the pentagram, um, the supreme invoking ritual, they call it, and uh, related techniques that mesh beautifully with Enochia. So, okay, I'm going to take up my ET uh, story there from that point. Because for a while, I was really focused on my initiatory advancement and the alchemy I was going through and the techniques I was learning. So the communication with the three kind of fell by the wayside for a while until I moved to Asheville in 1993 and went to the local Walmart and I found this. It was a model kit that was built according to the specifications of an engineer, a PhD engineer called Bob Lazar. I'm sure a number of you people have heard of him. Some perhaps not in a good light because there he has his detractors. But in that model was this booklet. That's what the engineers showed me in my mind when they were communicating with me that first time, precisely this. And everything that Lazar says in this booklet, which is taken from his physical investigations of a craft at what he calls Area S4, which most of us call Area 51, I think, or it's part of it. He said there was a craft just like this that was not built on Earth that he was part of a team of engineers reverse engineering the craft. He was specifically tasked with reverse engineering the propulsion systems. He didn't know a thing about the navigation or control systems, although he knew where they were. And he described the propulsion. He described the power mechanism, power plant. He'd, um, and I freaked out because 10 years earlier, then the time Lazar was working on this, in 1975, I got a 10-page communication that enumerated every detail, every single detail that he had about the propulsion and power generation in here was precisely what I had been given in that communication. I said, this cannot, I, I'm not crazy. This proves to me I'm not crazy. There's something to this. There has to be. And if anybody's interested in those details, I'll be glad to give them to you. Uh, sub I don't have that 10 page communication because I brought it to the attention in 1975 of the head of this metaphysical group that I was a part of. And he said, let me look at it for a while. And so I gave him, I said, this is the only copy I've got. Please do not lose it. A week later I went back and he said, what papers? You didn't give me any papers, and I never saw it again. Now, I'm not sure exactly what happened there, but I have my suspicions. But everything's in here. Everything significant that was in that paper, I remember. And so when I saw this and read what was in it, I said, holy shit, this cannot be, you know, happenstance coincidence. I remember running after I saw read that running upstairs to a friend of mine who used to do UFO conferences, which by the way, I've never done. And uh, ran upstairs yelling, 
It's real. I'm not crazy. <laughs> and we went over the whole thing with her. She said, you need to go to these conferences. And I said, no. The reason was, is that the impression I had, and to a degree still have, is that a large percentage of the people who talk about UFOs are either spreading purposeful disinformation or have a very inventive and creative mind. I, I, I tend to be somewhat suspicious. And that's the reason I've never gone public with this story, because I know this happened to me. I know what went on, and I know the reality of it. But I have no way to prove it to anybody, and I don't like people thinking I'm crazy. So <laughs> finally, I've decided that it's time to tell this story. Now, how does this connect to Anokia? Well, fast forward to 2003, 2003, and my wife, Terry, and I met. Now, we had encountered each other in a very strange event. Years and years, how many years? 18, before, 18 years before that, we encountered each other in Atlanta, accidentally, like two ships passing in the fog in the night. Uh, I ran into her um, right before I moved to Serenarit and saw her and something said, this is the person I'm going to wind up with. This is the person I'm going to end up with. But I was extremely, especially then, I still am to a degree, but I was extremely shy, very unsure of myself. And so I didn't know how to introduce myself to a stranger. I followed her around surreptitiously, hoping she didn't think I was stalking her and watched as she picked up a bunch of metaphysically oriented books, went up to the coffee shop, and was reading them and drinking coffee. And I was going to run up and introduce myself. And I chickened out and ran. And got in my car and left. And regretted it immediately. I felt like my heart was being ripped out. And I spent the next week driving all over that part of Atlanta. It was near Peachtree Battle Shopping Center. It and Bookstore. it was Oxford Bookstore, which no longer exists. And so I drove all over that part of Atlanta looking for her. Only later I found out that the place I ended before I gave up was the apartment she was living in. But I never saw her again until 03. And we got together. It was really clear that, that there was an instant bond. And in one of our conversations over the phone, we started talking about this incident that happened 18 years ago. And we confirmed that was each other, which was kind of amazing uh, to me. <laughs> uh, sounds like somebody's making this up but once again it was not somebody raised their hand what's what's up I just want to I want to give you a huge hug and a confirmation because your story and the time frame that this happened in was very very close to what happened to a group of contactees in Peru really Yes. That's very interesting. There's well, several books. I can I can find a way to send you uh English copies of it. Um, but uh it the they go by the name of Rama, Rama Mission. Mm -hmm. And they had um automatic writing that, that was uh from the uh the guides as they call them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And um, they asked, they didn't believe it. They asked for confirmation. Yeah. And the guides told them to go to a certain place at a certain time and they would arrive. And they did. Ah, and this, right. this continued. And this, so there's still, um, there's several branches of it, uh, of this group. I'm in one of them, although I am not. Julia Meyer in Switzerland also, yes. Well, Ram is, uh, it's got, has several branches. Um, some of them are more faithful than others. I'll just put it that okay. way. But I hope that would help well, thank confirm you. your experience. Well, well, thank you very much. Now, if I don't lose my train of thought, I need to kind of keep going here. But thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so for so around this time, I, thought, I decided it was safe to tell Terry about my experiences. So I did. And she suggested, why don't you start trying to communicate with them again? 
Uh, and I said, well, I suppose I can't. And, the crystal generator. and so there's a device sort of that I, that I have that I put together from a whole bunch of different kinds of crystals and other things at the instruction of the people we call the three back in uh, the eighties. I call it a crystal generator, uh, but it appears to be some kind of control device that uses subtle energies that we work with our minds that, that connect with it in a similar way, though not as intense, of course, as the way their devices do, because the three have told me that they use what we would now call consciousness assisted technology, that they interact with their controls of their craft telepathically. And they have devices that respond to it that are crystalline based, interestingly enough. Uh, so they had me build an, a, a, a primitive analog of their, one of their devices uh, that I call a crystal generator. It's, I'd be glad to show pictures of it, which I did not prepare for this presentation, but I have pictures of it uh, that I could share at some point. So they told us, so I went and used that, activated it. It sends up a beacon. And within a minute or two of sending the beacon up, I heard their voice. So I started relaying it to Terry. And so we began a series of conversations with them that continue to this day, actually. We, we aren't doing it on a regular schedule, but we do it when we feel it is necessary. And, uh, they, and Terry has been very good at asking questions I wouldn't dare ask, <laughs> that I didn't feel quite comfortable asking. And here's how it connects to Enochian. Besides a lot of things I've assumed about how they helped me develop my energetic abilities. And she asked them, are you the people who gave the Enochian system to Dee and Kelly? I would never have asked that. And they said, yes. They said it wasn't us specifically, these individuals, but it was our people, our species. And it could have been us because we have much longer lifespans than you did. And all of the three of us were here long before Dean Kelly left. They said that they'd actually been monitoring the human species for a very, very long time. And that they claim to have been part of an alliance that helped human civilization develop in that earlier form that we now call antediluvian. Uh, some people call it Atlantis. I don't think it was called that, but whatever it was called. It was kind of a worldwide civilization, similar to we've got a worldwide civilization now, and that they had helped it develop. And that by the end of it, when we went through that destructive period and lost the uh, central landmass that they lived on and lost the civilization except for pieces of it, that they helped us survive they helped us get through and that interestingly though that that what had happened before the destruction was that humanity itself had split into two factions a faction that was very appreciative to the extraterrestrial presence and what they had brought and what they had taught us and wanted to continue under their mentorship and the other faction was earth for humans first and a war ensued, and they ended up driving the uh, people who had helped us away. And they've largely been off planet ever since, with a few exceptions. But they've continued to work with us and continue to monitor us, because they knew we would come back around to where we are now. Um, and so the Enochian what they've told us, and it jives with what Vincent had surmised on his own. He didn't have anything to do with these communications. In fact, he was an extreme skeptic of almost all ET information. We found out 
before he died, he'd actually been communicated with, but he didn't trust anybody else. He only trusted his own communication and he wouldn't talk about it. Well, I kind of understand why. It's easy to be ridiculed. Um, so, um, what was I saying? Was um, you were you going to say something about clairvoyant and seeing those shapes? Oh, or, no. That's, no mm. okay, um, so, oh, yes. So, Vincent had this um, a presentation he put on for a few years called the Enochian Lifeboat Project, which he did with Dan Winter. And his thesis was that the Enochian information that was received by Dean Kelly and worked on ever since was in the nature of a, um, coconut, radio. a coconut radio given to humanity to help us survive, to help us receive the information and energies we needed to get through this very trying time. Um, so he believed that the Enochian system had something to do with us expanding our consciousness in a way that would help us get through this. Terry actually directly asked the three about this very subject and was told that, um, and I say she was told because when I would really go into a deep trance, I wouldn't remember anything. So she would have to tell me or record it and let me listen to it. But boy, that's a weird experience. But um, they said that it was through the use of the Enochian that if it was done in the right way, if it was used correctly and by a small handful of people who could build their own temples or what I call an Enochian installation, who could build their own, understood how to activate them, understood how to work with them properly, according to Vincent and our idea, that it would have a vastly more powerful effect on everything around us than we could imagine. It would be even greater than logarithmic. That it would help catalyze the expansion of human consciousness in the way that is necessary for us to prevent the destruction uh, to move out of primitivism and to develop a society that could join the greater society within the galaxy. So that's what we believe is the purpose for Enochian. And a lot of the innovations that we have, that we've initiated in our own practice of Enochian have become of, because of things that they have suggested to us, the, the three have. So um, I was worried about going public with this, but after the previous two pre presentations, I don't have much worry about it anymore. We, I realize and have realized that I have no idea, none of us do, but I was 70 uh, just uh, a little bit ago, I turned 70, and I have no idea how long I'm going to be here in this form. And so Terry and I both decided that we need to go as public with this as we can and make as complete a record of it as possible. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, and Salt says, happy birthday. Thank you. <clears throat> so in any case, our purpose in teaching the system as we know it, which is not the same as everyone else's, the purpose is, is to get a handful of people able to construct their own Enochian temple and or, as I call it, installation and uh, learn how to charge it, how to activate it, and how to start working with it. That if we had even just a handful of people, it would have a massive effect uh, around us energetically on the human mind. And, and that's the whole idea. We desperately, I think, that's my word, desperately, need to move into the next level of conscious awareness and the next level of evolution. Because 
um, you know, as Vincent called humans of the current type, he called us killer monkeys, basically. <laughs> He's not far wrong. And uh, we need to move out of the killer monkey phase to where we start developing real, honest to goodness, expanded consciousness, gal galactic consciousness. Um, and the three have reiterated what what mystery religions throughout the ages have said forever. And they've reiterated to us. We're all part of the same consciousness. Uh, we're all, you know, it doesn't matter what, not only what race or ethnicity we are, but what genetic species we are. It doesn't matter. We're all people and we're all consciousnesses. And we all have more in common than we have differences. Yes, it's thank you. Rebecca W says to everyone, this is what I'm trying to do. Well, good, because that's what we're trying to do. That's what we all, or as many of us as possible, should be trying to do. So. Um, Your specific samples of the Holy Table. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's see if I can find. I'm going to share the screen again. Now, where is the slide that we need? Okay, this these were all um, cue cards for me, which I ended up not using. Okay, the holy table most people work with. This is just one little detail I'll give you before I end. It, it, this comes from Casabon, who was not very supportive of what Dean Kelly were doing. Actually, he was trying to point out how terrible it was, but he did record it. And this is the holy table as he saw it. It didn't necessarily mean he understood it. If he, but what he did was is he saw the actual table with the ensigns of creation on it. Um. What he didn't have access to, and we do now, is the original information from Dee's journal, from his magical diary, that tells you how to construct this. And it doesn't mention the sigils of creation. It mentions uh, the colors and the arrangement, the outline of the, of the characters on the perimeter of the table and the square in the middle and what the characters are and the big hexagram. Um, we built ours according to his instructions, uh, not from Casabon. Vincent was convinced, and he had some what may be significant past life recall of that time and those events. I won't go into any more detail about that right now. But he was convinced that the instances of creation were used in a very specific working Specifically, specifically the heptagonal working that he did in Prague. And so for the general usage of the table, they weren't really necessary. So we didn't include them. Let me go next. This is ours. This is the one I put together according to Dee's description. All the borders were supposed to have been blue. I decided myself that the inner Enochian and the hexagram should be gold to symbolize spirituality, divine energy, and the sun. And then the pa symbol, which is phonetically B, B, in the corners it, are related to fire, and they're red, as are all the other characters. But they're red on gold. And so this is what we use because it was from Dee's original description. Okay, next... Oh, uh, we let's see. There's all this stuff I've already been over. Oh, yeah. Now, this is ha ha. This is all the things at the great table of earth. I'll just go ahead and bring them all up. These are things that the Enochian beings, angels, Ophanim, as Vincent Bridges liked to call them, because he connected them with the choir of angels called the Ophanim, who were closest to God. And he considered these intelligences to be an intermediary intelligence between beings like us and 
the central consciousness of the galaxy, which a lot of people like to call God. Um, so they're intermediaries. So Vincent would call them the Ophany. Now, what they said to Dean Kelly is this was what the Great Table of Earth contains. And I will tell you there's some significant parallels to uh, Buddhism, which is certain forms of Buddhism, but let me get to that in a minute. So the great table of earth, the four elemental tablets and the black cross that connects them, which we translate as the tablet of union. All human knowledge. Well, it is interesting that when you interact with an a, a Enochian installation that has been running for a while, you get information downloads. You never know what it's going to be, but you do. So I think that has to do with this. Out of that springeth physic, which was a 16th century way of saying medicine and health. The knowledge of the elemental creatures among you, how many kinds there are and for what use they were created, those that live in the air by themselves, those that live in the waters by themselves, those that live in the earth by themselves, and the property of fire, which is the secret life of all things, those four elements. We've got, you know, air, water, earth, and fire. And the five elements also add spirit. Then the knowledge, finding, and use of metals, the virtues of them, the congulations and virtues of stones, they, these preceding three things, are all of one matter, which sounds very much like ancient Greek philosophy to me. The conjoining and knitting together of natures, the destruction of nature and of things that may perish, moving from place to place, as into this country or that country at pleasure, which we can easily connect to remote viewing and astral projection. The knowledge of all crafts mechanical. And we connect this to consciousness-assisted technology, which, in, interestingly enough, we attended a conference in the south of France quite a number of years ago and did a presentation on Enochian as a consciousness-assisted technology. And then he ends with a phrase in Latin, transmutatio formalis sed non essentialis which means formal alchemical transmutation. Um, so what this all reminds me of, it is an incredible parallel to those facilities that are a byproduct of intense Buddhist practice over a period of time. They call them the CDs. And each one of them sounds like an incredible power, but they're just byproducts. They're not the focus of the Buddhist practice, they're byproducts. What they do is show you that you've been doing the practices correctly because you start developing these abilities. All of these things or many of these things that were mentioned by the angels about the great table of earth sound to me like CDs. So you work with the Enochian, you operate an Enochian temple or installation and interact with it on a regular basis, and things will come to you. And there will be things within you that will start to transform. That is the root of alchemy. So here's a plain black and white image of the great table all put together, the four elemental quadrangles all put together with the black cross that combines them. Now, what we have discovered, both talking to our friends, the three, working with Vincent when we were still able to work with him physically, and our own practice, is that given the fact that I can, I'm not the world's greatest clairvoyant, but I can see sometimes on other levels and sense things. I can sense energetic forms. I can sense energetic actions that are beyond third dimension. A lot of people can. I'm not saying there's anything special about me. It's just that it's very helpful that I can. Because when I first activated or charged, all of the Enochian furniture, according to Vincent Bridges' method, which actually is an echo of Aleister Crowley's method, 
And if you ever want to talk to me about that, boy, do I have a few interesting things to say. But um, as I activated each component, I saw it extrude itself into a minimum of three dimensions. These are all two-dimensional objects, right? But it appears to me, because of some things Vincent told me before I ever experienced this, and then what I experienced when I activated them or charged them, is that they unpack, they unfold. Into a minimum of three dimensions, I sensed eventually, as I activated more and more and more of the equipment, I sensed it binding itself into what I can only describe as a four-dimensional machine, it was a device. And every aspect of it, although they were separated by space, we had the four elemental tablets in the, in the four cardinal directions. We had the holy table in the middle of the room. We had the, whole, the seal of truth on top of, on top of that. We had the tablet of union on top of that. And we've got various other things and crystals that we use with them just to help boot, boot up the energy. But when all of it got activated, I saw it form itself into a unit. So apparently there are energetic connections between each of these components that exist not in 3D, but in 4D. Now, our brains are not wired to be able to visualize 4D. A few people can and I think they've got fairly advanced brains. Occasionally, I can kind of get close to it. But what I can do is look at, is have this machine, this Enochian temple or installation running, which we keep running all the time. We don't shut it off. We don't banish it. Um, I can feel and partially visually perceive all of these things connected with each other through the fourth dimension and operating. The first time I cranked up the uh, seal of truth, it, it, it extended itself out into a sphere and started rotating. And it made this humming noise, sort of like the music of the spheres or something. It made this, this sound. And as I activated more and more of the system, this sound increased. And I started seeing more and more of this energy in the corner of my eye connecting things till finally it was all activated and it was all running on its own. I didn't have to start it. According to Vincent's information, we do not banish. We keep it running because it is accumulating data. It's accumulating energy the longer it operates. Uh, what we do is the space around it we will banish. The space in the rest of our house, we will banish. If we do specific magical workings elsewhere, when we're done with them, we banish them. That's good, uh, good ceremonial magic haji. Um, and there, but there's automatically something taking care of the magical hygiene in the Enochian installation. And that's the seal of truth. The seal of truth has a symbol on the back that blocks out negative input. And then the all of the um, planetary magic that is indicated, all the different levels of it on the, the front part or the top part of the seal of truth, then organize and sanitize. So that what we get in the temple is what we need to get. We don't get any interference. And boy, you can tell if there is interference, let me tell you. Um, so I think we're getting very close to the end of the presentation here. Yeah, here, I was going to show you. Let, let's put all this together. You see, these are the quadrangles. you got to use the cursor. They can see your finger. I'm not using it. I'm not pointing. I'm just clicking. No, use the pointer to point to the... Oh, I see what you mean. So here we have the four portions, the four quadrangles of the great table separated into separate tablets, air, water, fire, and earth. And then the tablet of union, which, were, which is the condensation of that black cross that when they're all together, combines them, unites them. In four dimensions, this tablet of union 
unites them all. And I've been able to see that through my energetic work. Yep. So that is, in a rather large nutshell, the background behind how we approach Enochian and why we believe that the approach we are using is, for these purposes, the correct one. If there are any questions, I'll be glad to take any. Uh, if you're all just standing there going, why was that? And that's fine, too. <laughs> but... Uh, but I thought I owed it to the other practitioners here. You know, why, even though we don't have direct evidence of the correctness of our approach, why we believe it is. You want to stop here. Okay, here we go. Point. Are there any questions before we move on? Okay. Hello. Come out of the state you've put us all into sir oh okay so, <laughs> hi that was a amazing uh yeah let's give it up for oh for Alan. thank you thank you very, very much i would tell you the truth i was real nervous about presenting my story because i've held on to it all these years because of fear of repercussions but this is my actual experience it isn't dream work it isn't meditation work. It isn't vision. It's my actual experience. Um, hand, the first hand, I believe, is Irene. And then uh, Daniel Rexhan says, thanks for sharing. And and I love the fact, I just I just have to, to I, I have to appreciate that. <laughs> How do I say this? I love that you were, I guess you said nervous about the content of your talk, but then you saw the other ones. And yeah, I said, well, maybe it's not so out there. Okay. You're okay. You're doing fine. <laughs> yeah, what I never mentioned, by the way, was the congruence between the stuff Dr. Stephen Greer says and my experience. I tend to believe him mostly because he's one of the few who what he says parallels what's happened to me. And so for my purposes, I tend to believe him. Same with Bob Lazar, even though there are people who say, oh, he's full of shit. Well, there was that thing that happened to me. I got all this information before he did. So where did he get it? I think we're uh, everyone who's now familiar with Mr. Rekshan's work is going to now uh, do a little contemplation on how we even re uh, absorb these sort of this sort of data when people give it to us now in the future because we all have knee jerk reactions that have been trained through us. Oh yeah, yeah. So well, it's bring... been a very effective disinformation campaign for decades. Yeah, decades. Yeah. that's why I didn't say anything to most people for so long. Yeah. Um. So Irene, you're first, and Rebecca, I think you're second. Can you control yes. that? I can indeed. Okay, good. <laughs> I know you asked me to stop calling you sir a while back, but. Man. It's just, you know what it is? It's us younger uh, cultists who are actually just like tired of <laughs> the way culture is. And we're just trying to bring back a little, you know, we might not be allowed to wear, we can maybe can't wear wigs all the time, but, and, and you know, oh. I don't know. But bringing back a little etiquette could, isn't the worst thing for our world at this no, time. No, it is, it isn't. Let's, you know, let's be nice to each other, okay? Yeah. Amen. Irene. Hi, Irene. Okay. Hi, uh, I uh, love uh, how you see a machine. And I I saw you like, I must have looked you up on YouTube, you and Terry, about 2017 or so. Oh. And I saw your crystal machine. Oh, yeah. And, oh, so you've seen it. Yeah. And uh, I, and I remember I remembered you as soon as you started speaking. And uh, I wrote down two sort of unimportant questions, but... but um, uh, when you were talking about your story about how shy you were and you didn't get to meet her, oh, that touched my heart. <laughs> and, and and so I wanted to ask you when you met her the second time, I didn't hear how did you meet her the second time? Okay, well, I didn't tell all of that, but you know that uh, intentional community, Sarah and Arid, that I was living at for a while, uh, we put on uh, a gathering. Then invited a whole bunch of magical people there 
uh, during the full moon in May, which we called May Moon Madness. And my friend Vincent Bridges had been coming there for a while. He was a friend of Sarah Nared. That's how I met him. And he and Terry had been communicating online for a long time. And um, he invited her to come. And so she showed up. And I was at uh, the fire, at, a, at a, a little fire in our camping area uh, with my smaller harp playing. And, uh, and we connected there. And that was it. He, he came. He came to the campfire with a harp and started playing harp for me. Like it doesn't get better than this. <laughs> and so, that's yeah, that's that's how we connected, and we connected through Vincent. So from the very beginning, we were both working on things with Vincent and learning things from Vincent. And I'm so very glad we did. We don't have, have access to him anymore, but there's a lot of record left behind by it. And Terry and I have been together ever since. So. And I, I also have your Ophanem uh, book by uh, The End of Time. I love that book. Oh, that one, yes. Alchemy in the End of Time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so my last, uh, I don't want to stop you from talking. But no. I have one last question. Yes. So on that font that you were talking about, uh, you were naming the lady that was the artist of the font. Now, I went to college and for graphic design, and I graduated in 2014. And uh, I have a fondness for fonts, and I didn't get her name. Oh, Darlene. Uh, for a long time, she, she went by Darlene Bridges, although I'm not sure they were oh. formally married, but they were partners for a long time before he moved to Europe. And uh, she still lives in Mount Gilead, North Carolina, where they live together. And um, she did a lot of graphic work for his Enochian stuff. And one of the things she did is she went through the entire Enochian alphabet from the originals, from D's originals, and uh, cleaned them up, neatened them up, and did them according to modern font practices, and created a true type font, which uh, is called Darlinochian. <laughs> and, uh, oh, that's wonderful. And I made a couple of actual modifications to it that made me a little more comfortable with it, just a couple of small ones on a couple of the letters. And that's what I prefer to use. It, it, but I think it's really important to credit people when they've done some work and not to just assume, oh, well, everybody will think it's me. No, uh, no, no. Darlene did the work, so I want to give her credit for it. She well, also thank you very much. There's an article out there that she and Vincent worked on together that she has the credit for uh, that's talking about the Enochian characters as energetic waveguides. And she analyzes all of the shapes according to that principle. And I think it's really well taken. It's really good because the language itself in our experience isn't specifically like a language of communication. It appears to have been specifically created for interaction with humans and originally English speaking humans, because Dee and Kelly both spoke English. So the phonetics are easy for an English speaker, uh, not meaning that other people can't use it, of course. Uh, but, um, oh, my mind. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Darlene doesn't use a last name, but if you search for Darlene Enochian oh, Journal yeah, of the I Western know. Mystery Tradition, you'll find the article. Yeah, it's you'll really find the article. article. And what I was going to say was, is that it appears that the language is more used for the production and utilization of certain kinds of subtle energies. Yeah. That when you vib speak or chant or vibrate, as we say in ceremonial magic, the words, it has an energetic effect, a powerful energetic effect. And so that is how you use the language, is you use it as a generator of certain kinds of energies. And, um, and that's how we approach it. I mean, it can be translated into English, you know, if you stretch it a bit. And of course, the interpretations originally that Dee and Kelly used were very Christian in tone of the time, but I'm not sure you couldn't interpret them in different ways. But I know having gone through all of the Enochian calls and ethers, using these pronunciation techniques and vibration with 
a properly charged and activated Enochian installation around you, it has an incredibly powerful effect. You can feel it tactily in the air. I believe it. And I wanted you to know I saw the Lazar uh, Joe Rogan interview also. So I'm like, I, I, I could just relate Poor to everything. Been through hell. He has <laughs> been through hell with all the yeah. who discredit him and everything. And he just wants to live his life. And he experienced, the interesting thing to me is he experienced all of this and wrote about it and talked about it from an experience he had 10 years after I got the same information through my contact. That just blew me away when I found that out. I was like, what? You mean this is real? <laughs> well, does anyone else have uh, Thank a question? Thank you. Oh, certainly, certainly. Hi, Ellen. I am just, Hi. I'm just blown away. And uh, I want to go deep and I want to learn. I, I just want to, uh, I just want to uh, pick your brain and download it all. <laughs> <laughs> so well, I would be happy to talk with you, you know, after, you know, the conference thing and everything after all of this is, is, is done. I would be happy. Let's, let's, Make sure we know how to get in touch. Okay, um, I'll message you in the in the chat uh, directly. How's that? Mm. Okay, email work for you. Yes, it does. Uh, do you have my? I can give you my email address. Yeah. This you is can. a good chance for me to actually interject. If you uh, will pardon the intrusion, say the community sections on the website. You can actually tag each other and all the presenters have accounts. So you can actually, that's okay. one way to at least make initial contact for okay. anyone in this group who wants to communicate with anyone else, including the presenters. So it's a nice, fun little feature with the membership site. But there you go. Great. Great. Okay. Okay. I'll do that then. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Okay. I'm sure there must be some other questions. I, I certainly could have a few. I was distracted with having to fix something. So I missed little tiny bits of your talk that I heard the word Stella Matutino as in the other room. I was like, oh, what am I missing? Oh my God. But that was amazing overall. Just and having a the, the approach you took was a nice contrast to some of the others and and and, uh, and wonderful. What would you say um, coming as a Golden Dawn Hierophant from the Golden Dawn world and system? Um, What's the most important difference? If you could, if you could, uh, it doesn't have to be the most important, but what's a notable difference from the Golden Dawn method uh, that you think is worth highlighting, maybe? Or that's oh, I maybe already good. said something about it, but I'll reiterate yes. it. Uh, and that is the Golden Dawn, the people who put it together, whoever they might be, we suspect who we know who, but. Um, they recognized that the Enochian had inherent power, but clearly they didn't have access to a lot of the information we have now, the stuff in the Klein volumes that has everything that came through to Dean Kelly. They, they didn't have, but they recognized that it was powerful. So what they did was, is to the extent of their understanding, they used the Enochian tablets to juice up the elemental initiations with that elemental energy and that's pretty much where it ended they didn't really do anything else with it they didn't know what to do with the holy table the seal of truth any of that stuff they, they, hmm? didn't, even know about they didn't probably didn't even know about them so they used the elemental tablets in the initiations and uh that's pretty much it so it was like a very brief introduction and 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 if you had to go on your own at that time to find out anything more about the Enochian system. We've gone quite a ways past that. <laughs> yes, I, I can say one thing actually to that, which doesn't erase what you're saying at all. But I can say that uh, we, we know for a fact that the Mather's papers on the Heptarchia for instructing adepts, as well as his papers on the Aethers, were both burned. And we know when they were burned and who burned the copies, but they right. appear in all the members' diaries. So we know, obviously, therefore, right. that they... Right. And, of course, we have, therefore, demonstration of how Mathers taught 
scrying and traveling through the aethers because that's what Crowley then did it. So that's why Alistair Crowley is often a representative of the best version of Golden Dawn magic, Enochian oh, magic, because he was in his early years doing what he learned there. And until we found out about the burned papers, of course, and, you know, we're getting a lot of old documents released now through some the, oh, the yeah, blessings there's, there's like, like uh, well, out. we all know who, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Uh, yep. Mr. Um, Anthony's got a question, so we'll go there again. I did have one more question if we have time, but I'll let Anthony go now. Anthony, yeah. Yeah, can you hear me all right, Alan? Yeah, I can hear you. Sure. Okay. Um, I guess my question, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share like a, a tiny example to assist my question. In the Enochian temples I've been a part of, um, we would always have an intent. Um, I wasn't always necessarily privy to that intent, but I could see that there was mm. the higher the higher uh, initiates were working on an intention, and and so I wanted to ask when you set up a you, you've got your room running all the time, but when you're in there working, what would be an example of an intent or a purpose to doing the work as a group? Okay, well, there's two, there's more than one level to this. Overtly, if we're going into the Enochian temple and or installation, I like to call it installation because it seems to me like a machine. <laughs> but uh, it's good magical practice to have an intent before you do any working. Otherwise, things can get out of hand, things can slip. Uh, you need to have everything focused. You need to have things focused. Now, within that focus and within that intent, you always leave room with good magical practice for things to happen you don't anticipate, for new information to come in, for the magic to happen. But within that, you need a structure that keeps out the influences you don't want and an intent that helps focus things. So the intent's not a bad idea. The difference with the Enochian installation kind of as a whole and in general is that it is running its intent 24-7. Its intent is to accumulate data from the beings that originated it, the Ophanim, whoever they were, whoever they are, uh, the divine energy of the galaxy, whatever you want to call it, uh, and to absorb and compile that. At the same time, then, to radiate out a resonance that helps catalyze the expansion of human consciousness wherever it touches. And that's why it's important to have more than one. Because if you have several, then their effect is multiplied many fold. And the highest intent I can think of for this particular work and uh, temple or installation of this nature is to catalyze necessary human conscious evolution. We can see the dramatic need for that right now, I think. I don't think it's hard to see that at all. So that's my answer. And for individual and sometimes you. For the benefit of Oh, well, also when we do an individual, Terry reminds me that when, whenever we do an individual intent, we usually add to that for the benefit of all. It's not, you need to be, you get the best effect out of the Enochian energy and work. If you're working from a transpersonal standpoint, if you're thinking Kabbalistically, Tifereth or Tifaret, you need to have an inclusive, transpersonal, benefic intent whatever else you're trying to energize. Does that make sense? Yes. It's all of us or none of us. Yes, exactly. And that's the state of consciousness humanity as a whole needs to get to. It's all of us or none of us. And that needs to be so crystal clear, obvious, that it needs not even be discussed when we're where we need to be. Anything else? We have a, uh, yeah, Professor uh, J. Paul here typed a question, but do you want to rephrase it yourself in your own words? Uh? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious what has, what brought me into the work of John D. several years ago was the, the language in the crop circles. And I'm wondering if there's any comparison 
or comparability to that. And I really appreciated your presentation. And I really appreciated you telling your story. It ties in with my experience with Billy Meyer and all of that. But there's something going on here in terms of connecting. And thank you very much. But specific, oh, yeah. That too. But specifically, I'm just wondering if there's a connection here with the messaging that is coming in these field forms in England as well as in the United States and all over the world. Well, I don't think we've addressed this directly. Correct me if I'm wrong, Terry. But I've always had a personal sense that it is very much connected, that it is one of the many modes of communication that these higher dimensional, higher consciousnesses are trying to connect with humanity and facilitate humanity's growth in some way or another, and that it is a different angle for the same intent. Good. You got it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's good. That I like your conclusion there. Thank you. But again, I appreciate again a second time. I appreciate you sharing having the courage to share that experience. And, and I think Daniel will really appreciate that as well. And more people need to be speaking about all that because it is, it is, it is vital. It's a turning point. It Thank is. You. It's extremely important. So we can't, we can't overemphasize the importance. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you both. And one more question, Raven. Um, so out of curiosity, um, what are your recommendations for mankind to um, to achieve that collective state, to evolve? Do you have any wow. guidelines? Yeah, well, yeah, step by step. Yeah, that, Not that may be, you know, beyond the current awareness. I am aware that that's necessary. I'm aware that it's very necessary. I feel a sense of urgency. But as far as step by step, how to achieve that? Well, I mean, I can tell you things that have happened to me in my life, but why have I come to the state of mind that I've got about it? How, you know, it's been a long series of events through my entire life. And I, what I didn't say, I did, there was a little detail that I left out. And that is after I started communicating with these three, as I, as I call them. They said, we've been, we've been interacting with you all your life since you were born. We've been watching you. And then they started reminding me of different events that had happened through my childhood. And I remembered, and I said, that was you? When I was seven years old, I was uh, in the backyard in our garden and fell asleep on the ground, woke up looking up at the trees, and there were these this group of adults. I was about seven years old. There's a group of adults, beautiful, with beautiful faces, all standing around in a circle looking at me. And they seemed to glow. There, there was a, a light that seemed to be coming out of them. So I've always since then called them the shining ones. And they said, don't be afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of, which I wasn't. Uh, they said, you've been wondering who your real parents are, because I knew that my real parents, as loving as they were, did not in any way understand me, and it was clear. So I don't hold anything against my mother for that, but, but I always wondered, you know, where am I really from? And they said, we're, we're your family. You were one of us, and we're here to take care of you and guide you. Don't you worry, we'll be here. And then that was all. They was like, then I was asleep again and I woke up and everything was gone. So, I mean, it could have been a dream, but the three said, no, that was, that was a form of us. They, they took on a form that appeared to me in a way that wouldn't startle me. And uh, there were little things like that that happened all through my life that told me that Somebody has been mentoring me without me being consciously aware of. And they did say that I had been prepared gradually to be able to receive greater and greater doses of their particular kind of energy so that I would more easily be able to communicate with them when the time came, when it was the right time. So apparently. So do you, do you think that people um, are, are 
born this way. Like, I mean, like, um, compared to, uh, like, the comparison between the profane and... (laughs) Oh, I think think that a lot of people have inborn abilities that because our culture does not recognize their existence, we rarely develop them on our own. But I think they're there. And so apparently I had some inborn abilities to sense and run certain kinds of energies. And they built on it, though. They, they said they did alterations at the molecular level and the genetic level with me. I wish they'd made me better looking. But, uh, <laughs> but so, so apparently it's a combination of things. And if people simply would be more open to ideas like this, the most important thing is to have a clear and somewhat innocent heart to, to, to recognize that it isn't all about me, it's about us. And that's a greater thing than me. Because- Never let the child die. No, us does not deny selfhood. It expands selfhood. It makes me think of, of William Blake's high innocence. You know? <laughs> there you go. Well, I'm going to have to go shortly. So yes, yeah, this was a thank you, everyone, for a fabulous Q and A section. Uh, do you want to hold a tarot card up for a door prize quickly? Get, 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 she's going to get my deck. Wonderful! Look at that mercurial speed. Yeah, Terry's a multiple Gemini. I am just oh, really information. The most Cancerian person you will probably ever meet. I have. I was born during a solar eclipse in Cancer. Uh, I have Sun, Moon, Jupiter, all less than a quarter degree, and then I have Mercury, South Node, Uranus, and Ascendant, all in Cancer. Most wow. of that's in the twelfth house. <laughs> well, thank you very much to Terry also for all her help. Okay, so let's look through. Oh, I'll get a major Arcana card, and we'll see. You want two or one? Just one. Just one. Okay, well, this is the one that was on top, so I'm going to use this one. Whoops, this way. This is um, the deck that was uh, painted by Tabby Cicero, which I really like a lot. I love the symbolism in it. So, so folks, assuming uh, you haven't won a door prize already, go ahead and guess. Yep. Uh, Let the games begin. We got one for the hermit, magician, universe, the nope. emperor. Nope. It's hard to guess, unless you've got a real good reception. <sighs> okay, I'm projecting. Uh, I think you saw part of it, but no. It's not the star. Temperance? No. Rebecca Lovers? said tower. No. Let's not invoke that right now, shall we? Uh, Moon? No. Nope. Although when he had said star, he kind of was on the right track. Sun oh, isn't the star. The sun? No. That would have been too obvious. Yeah. <laughs> your, your cunning is greater than that. We got a guess for the moon, the empress. Uh, Venus. I mean, what is that? That's the Empress, but no. (laughs) No. We all need a little more of this. Spring. Strength. No. Yeah, you can you you can give away hints if you want. 
Yeah. It's well, your party. Uh, temperance. Yeah, no, it's not temperance. Oh, read there. Oh, who got it? Saul to everyone. Wheel of Fortune. So, brother David Saul, he's our ghost hunter coming up to when I camp said with star, us. There's a star in the middle of it. So, all right. Uh, we got the Wheel of Fortune. Yep. Yeah. That's it. Nice. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. So, David Saul, you have won a door prize. Uh, I believe it's the last, the last geomancy reading with. Magus Johannes Faustus, who's very smart and is getting a lot of promotion out of his gifts. I will, I, getting tons and tons of door prizes was one of the things I just wasn't capable of doing after my, my sister That's passed. So, um, but I, you know, I'm, I, we've, we've still put, we've pulled it off. Thank you, everyone. This is amazing. We've got a huge feature presentation with Terry after this. Uh, and the raffle for for her for her will be for our, the most valuable thing we could ever give anyone, which is of course a rock. <laughs> <laughs> From I always dinner. collected rocks as a kid, and yes. I gave them names, and I felt like they were conscious. Well, this is a rock from the Boleskin Manor. From the donated by the Boleskin Foundation. Really? Oh, yes. So it's from the original manor. Um, you can all, anyone can get one. They sell them. It's it's brilliant. It's a, they're selling rocks to help pay for the new building. So you can go get one yourself. Don't feel like you've missed well, out by great. the raffle. That manner of speaking. I mean, selling rocks is honestly one of the most brilliant things I've ever heard of. There's a comedian who named Cam Patterson who sells rocks at his shows because he likes rocks and it's genius. He just goes to Home Depot, picks up a huge bag of rocks, and makes probably ten grand a show selling rocks. I ten bucks pet a rock. No, no, pet rocks. It's wild. It's wild. All right, folks. Um, okay. uh, Terry, yeah, do you want? To, shall we? Shall we extend the break a little bit? How long should our break be before we come back? Because we probably, probably fifteen minutes from now is just a, probably a bit too soon. Yeah. Well, you you call it. I'm good. Any, however we do it. My intuition would say, let's do it at the at the half hour at at five thirty okay. Pacific time. Give us all forty five minutes to just absorb, absorb. I. I there's yeah. a lot to absorb. Yes, this has been an amazing day. We have recordings. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I hopefully you're recording uh, downloads because it will be high, much higher quality video on you, and uh, and uh, hopefully mine will too. Uh, so far, all my videos have downloaded successfully, except for Bartimaeus Black's, but his did download. So the redundancy was a smart move. You can tell I've been doing this a while. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm going to let Terry take over on this. You're going to need to do okay. whatever you need to do with the recording. One last time. I will see you again. Thank you. Thank you much. Yeah. Such a freaking treat. And can't wait to meet you next year. And when you go, we get well, you out to great. Vancouver. Awesome. Hey, that will be great. Camping cabins. <laughs> if you guys are down for the retreat afterwards, we'll make the cabins happen. And we'll move heaven on earth to make that happen. Let's do it. I think retreat next year with the, with the Burnses. <laughs> We didn't hyphenate our name because Burns Moore just sounded too bad. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 my, my mind went to Simpsons for some reason, so I said that it that way. I think he sat <laughs> me down here to push stop on the recording. And oh, I, oh yes, yes, we can both stop the recordings now. <laughs>